Good morning, church. Good to see you here this morning. Hope you are doing really, really well. Hope you've had a great weekend. Uh, and enjoyed yourself. And those of you that are visiting, we are thrilled to have you here uh, with us today and uh, glad you could join us for worship service. And we hope to get to know you as well. So stick around and chat for a little bit. We love having visitors and some of you may be new online and we're thrilled that you could be with us uh, uh, as well. Look forward to you being able to come and visit with us. Uh, so this past weekend we did a thing. Lots of things were happening. Uh, we had the ladies, um, young girls from various congregations in the area came for a uh, lock-in that Lydia uh, conducted, and that was great. We had a KPT water event uh, yesterday uh, as well. And you may have noticed that, <coughs> excuse me, there were some rather positive messages that were on some of the parking lot spots and uh, chalk and stuff that was done in. And we had a men's group take a take what I hope to be uh, the first of several uh, out. Uh, some maybe not to this scale, maybe some even bigger. We'll see in the, the future. But we went to uh, West Virginia for a whitewater <coughs> uh, rafting and adventure trip. Um, we started out once we got there near this bridge, which is one of the largest uh, arch bridges in West Virginia. You've probably heard about it at some point. In October, they even have people jump off of it all the time with parachutes, mostly with parachutes. So that's good. And uh, so we started our morning there and the weather was amazing. 70s? Oh my goodness. 70 degrees. It was so perfect and beautiful. We tied up ropes and we went uh, rappelling, some for the first time. Some had done it before. I was thrilled that Chris was able to go because we got to do it before when he was 14 years old. And, uh, you know, that was kind of fun to get into it. But you can just see how magnificent God's creation is. And to spend time with each other in the midst of that is fantastic. We got different uh, angles here and different people that are participating. Uh, Noah went off and I tell you, one, just quick something really good about this with Noah is that he got up and he said, let me just see what it feels like to be um, at the edge. Let me see what it's like at the edge. And as you can see, Noah went past the edge uh, and got to enjoy God's great creation of gravity, which is fantastic. And you can see he's about 80 <coughs> feet up and he had this great quote while he was about this point. He says, I'm more nervous now than I am when I read scripture at church. And I was like, all right. I said, you're doing both, man, and you do both really well. So that was, that was really good. So we had good moments like that. We had uh, Greg going, you can just see the beautiful views with Greg going over the side there and uh, the bridge in the background, the, the trees, the clouds. We had people showing their appreciation for using no hands whatsoever. And man, the stares I got sometimes were something in Christian love, I'm sure. Uh, but take your hands off, trust the rope, trust the people. Well, that's church, so that's good. Uh, uh, Nick climbed back up the cliff, so that's pretty exciting as well. And no one was injured, so that was fantastic. We did after this and go eat lunch and then we went whitewater rafting. We don't have any of the pictures of our actual group from whitewater rafting because um, they got one of our boats, but we couldn't get all the pictures, whatever. This is actually from a trip we did in 2019, but it shows the spirit of whitewater rafting. And actually our water was higher this time. And so this has some of those glorious moments which I love in the whitewater rafting, which is you drop over into it and then you find yourself in the middle of a giant wave and you are crashing through this uh, wave. You can't see people around you. You're being yelled at to paddle and paddle and give me three more, give me three more. And you're like, I can't breathe. I can't see. This is so good. Thank you, Lord. It, good moments in the midst of that. So this was fantastic. And we had, the water was a little bit higher than normal. So it was moving, which means we had some rapids you wouldn't normally get. And some were covered up a little bit. Meat grinder was covered up, so we didn't get that one. But um, we had all kinds of good times. And uh, the guides were fantastic. Uh, this one had interesting hair. You can see some of it's a little colored. And some of it had to crop off, but interesting person. Big personalities, and they were super fun. They did allow, we had to be broken up into two rafts. And uh, Jordan, I think her name, she uh, crashed in the back of our raft and allowed uh, Nick, and I can't remember who else, boarded our raft and started pushing us off. Uh, so that was kind of fun and uh, really enjoyed that moment. But as you can see, we ended the day back at the bridge, but now underneath it. And so kind of a full day. What I do like about this and the group 11 that went was like, this was just people in the church, Christians going on a trip together, getting to know each other better, spending time, having some adventures. It's just the way life should be. What a blessing. What a blessing to be able to do this. And I hope more will participate and I hope we get to strengthen the fellowship in our congregation and uh, kind of build those relationships uh, in the future. We cannot be stuck where we are. 
we'll transition into the lesson. Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is talking to chief priests and elders of the people. It tells us in verse 23. And they are questioning his authority. And they're coming at him kind of hard because they don't like what he's doing, which is mind boggling. Why would you not love what Jesus is doing? But they're coming at him really hard. And they're questioning his authority and they're trying to get him to stop what he's doing by any means they can. And so they're coming at him with some theology and they're coming in with him uh, from his position. And he asks them these really poignant questions that are really tough. And this one is using a parable to illustrate repentance and giving them an opportunity to see where they are in their spiritual relationship with God. He's going to point out that they're stuck. They may be the preeminent religious leaders. They may be people of great social power and, and position. They may be people that, <coughs> excuse me, on the outside look like they got it together. But spiritually, they're stuck in a very dangerous place. And he's given them an opportunity, things to think about, things to challenge them to come out of it. We aren't meant to be stuck spiritually. God wants us to thrive. He really wants us to thrive. And so when Jesus is saying this, I'm, I'm loading this up at the front because this is the context to read it. He's really trying to get them to understand you're in the wrong position. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. And it's striking language that he uses. He says, but what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he regretted it, and he went. Verse 30, he came to the second and said, likewise. And he said, he answered and said, I go, sir. But he didn't go. So which of the two did the will of his father? And they said, the first. And Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. There's the striking language. It wasn't the simple part that here's a guy that said, I won't do it, but then he did. Okay, that's great. Or the guy that says, I will not, I, I will do it, but, but he didn't. It was the point when it became very personal, very personal. Jesus said, I say to you, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. People that you would assume are stuck in a social position because remember, in the Near East, in that mindset, you did not separate your religious life from your daily life. It was all connected. Therefore, if you were stuck, if you were less than spiritually the way that tax collectors and harlots would have been viewed, then socially you are an outcast as well to be disregarded. But Jesus is pointing out saying they were not stuck in that position. They moved spiritually into the kingdom of God. And yet these people who would have the appearance of being quite spiritual and, and, and quite strong are stuck in opposition to God. And those weren't just weak accusations he was making. This was Jesus who knows the hearts of men. This is Jesus who knows the truth of who we are more so than we do ourselves. And of course it would come to light. If you skip down to verse 46, they were so troubled by what he was saying. They couldn't accept what he was saying that they sought to lay hands on him, to impede him physically, ultimately violently. But they wouldn't do it out of fear of the people. They were stuck, stuck in a sinful mindset towards the son of God, stuck uh, because they were restricted by the thoughts and emotions of the people, stuck because they were willing to physically impede Jesus any means necessary, but it didn't work out. It brings us to us, stuck, stuck. You ever been caught in a spider web? Let's back up a little bit, maybe a little more positive about it. You ever been walking in the morning and the dew's just landed on a spider web and as the sun's rising, it just comes right through it. And you kind of marvel at the beauty of nature just a little bit, even though it's a spider web there, there's a thing that's kind of amazing that that tiny, tiny little arachnid built this amazing looking web and it may string itself across several plants. And there's a moment where you're like, wow, that is something really special to see. You hate it when you walk through it and don't see it. You ever been that person where you're freaking out just a little bit over it? Not so beautiful then, but at these moments, something special. But you, <coughs> you don't want to be stuck in it because you know there's consequence. There's a spider in there somewhere and you may not always see it. Even in this picture, it's a little hard to see the spider, but it's there. 
And it may make you slightly uncomfortable to think about it. And right now, some of you may be picturing what it feels like for it to crawl up your arm. And maybe it's caught in your hair. And I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, probably. I repent, do I? (laughs) But it's there. And there's consequences. And if an insect is caught inside the spider web and the time has passed, it's too late. It's stuck. It's caught. It's devastating consequences. What if that's our spiritual life? There's a beautiful thing that seems attractive and maybe we feel we're moving in towards that. But if it's in opposition to God and we do have his standard and we do have his word and we do have what he wants, maybe the consequences are coming at us and we're stuck in a place we shouldn't be. Thankfully, the scripture teaches us that is not what God wants for us. You don't have to be stuck. In fact, you shouldn't be stuck. You have opportunity. And we see it in unexpected examples. Rehoboam, for example. Now, Rehoboam is not one of those characters in the Old Testament that have quite the notoriety of, say, Moses or Abraham or David or such. In fact, if you are familiar with uh, Rehoboam, we're going to hit that big story that we mostly talk about him for. But I think in those moments, as we did last week with uh, Abram and Abraham, there's these moments that are really interesting in their lives. It's not necessarily the big story, but it's there. And I love diving in a little bit extra and learning just a little bit more about these people and the ones that are uh, surrounding them. And we have that with Rehoboam. Now, as you know, the first three kings of uh, Israel were, of course, Saul, David, and Solomon. And then Rehoboam came. But it wasn't just Rehoboam, Jeroboam, because this is where the kingdom divides. This is where the kingdom divides. And it's dividing because of sin. It's dividing because Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 11, had given himself over to the worship of so many false gods. And he had caught himself up, stuck with so many uh, of his choices and wives that had led him into paganism. And he was setting up temples and altars and building and things. And of course, this was in opposition to God. And God had blessed him so much. It even appeared to him and given him some opportunity and given him incredible wisdom that was renowned throughout the world and had given him incredible wealth. And instead of using those things for the worship of God, he had turned them over to paganism. You can't have that. He's stuck in his sinfulness. Well, there would be consequences. And Jeroboam would, would rise up. And even God told Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 11 that if he would remain faithful to God and serve him and follow him, that God would bless him. But Jeroboam himself did not do that. As you know, he built temples uh, and, and altars in the high places so people wouldn't even go down to Jerusalem. Their minds were stuck in worldliness and self-preservation and power and such, stuck in those things. But they don't have to be. And Rehoboam certainly had his issues and we can read about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 10, 11, 12. And if you want to turn there, that's where we're largely going to spend our time. 2 Chronicles 10, 11, and 12. He had these moments that were so great and fantastic, but others were just stuck, stuck in places in opposition to God. The most famous story, generally speaking, about Rehoboam is the one in 2 Chronicles chapter 10. He's taken over as king. And the people are coming to him with Jeroboam who had been hiding in Egypt uh, uh, with the king of Egypt there, which we'll get to him in chapter 12. And they come to him and uh, they're asking about the heavy load, the burden, the taxation. He says, come back to me after three days in verse 5. And the people departed. So the first thing Rehoboam does is go to the older, more experienced, wiser people in the kingdom, the elders. Verse 6, King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. So these were guys who were were spending time with the wisest man who had ever uh, lived. And he says, how do you advise me to answer these people? That's a pretty good move. Ask the experts. Ask the people who have experience. And they spoke to him saying, if you are kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And they consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him, people of less wisdom and less experience. And he said, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Verse 10, the young men who had grown up with him spoke saying, thus you should speak to the people who have spoken to you saying, your father had made our yoke heavy. 
uh, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little fingers shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. Ooh, extra harsh. So Jeroboam and, all the, Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had directed. and said, He said, come back to me the third day. Then the king answered them roughly. King Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders. He spoke to them according to the advice of the young men. My father had made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. And he goes on and increases. Now Solomon himself had given them a heavy workload and given them an incredible taxation, which you can read about uh, in the scriptures. And he's saying, I'm, I'm doubling down on that. And I'm going to be the kind of leader who's going to make it very rough for you. Ignoring the advice. Well, of course, the people rejected this and they left him. And in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 20, you can see that they made Jeroboam their king. And this is the division of the kingdoms. Ten tribes went to the north to follow after Jeroboam. And of course, he didn't want them to go to Jerusalem, as I said before. So he set up two high places for them to worship golden cows yet again and led them away from God. Rehoboam went to Jerusalem and set up his kingdom to the south. And this would be called Judah from here on out in their history until, of course, they're all put into exile. Uh, the north first with the Assyrians and then the tribes of Judah following uh, the lineage of Rehoboam uh, to the Babylonians. This is the first thing that most people know about Rehoboam his unwise behavior. And he doubled down with it even more so by sending probably the worst choice he could have uh, to go approach the people who had rejected him. He sent Hadaram, who was in charge of the revenue. He sent the guy who had been tied to the heavy burdens and the heavy taxation to go try to claim it from the people who had just rejected them. Not the wisest move. They ended up rising up and stoning that guy and they killed him. Well, Rehoboam then in chapter 11, he moves on and he builds fortifications and he raises an army and his intent is to go attack the Israelites. And in this moment, you can see a, a bit of light crack because he does cause this great army to rise up and he is prepared to go make the attack. But God sends someone to speak and say, don't attack them. Don't attack your brothers. And in chapter 11 and in verse 4, therefore they obeyed the words of the Lord and they turned back from attacking Jeroboam. So you can see there's this light, this moment in which he has this tendency to where he's listening to God. It's there. The possibility is there. The opportunity is there. Showing us you don't have to be stuck. As a consequence of this, all the priests came down from Israel and dwelled in Jerusalem because Jeroboam had utterly rejected them with sitting up the high places. And Jeroboam did not want them to go, the people to go to Jerusalem. So the priests had lost their position. So they go and set up uh, in Jerusalem. And because of that, they are leaning, leaning Rehoboam in the direction of the Lord. And for three years, they seem to be moving in that position. But things shift after this. Chapter 11, he builds up fortifications, becomes a military power. He does listen to God. The priests do come down. So it seems pretty good. But it's not great. Chapter 12, this is the one we want to focus on. The lesser known story. But it's critical for what we're talking about. And the fact that you don't have to be stuck. You get choices. Now it came to, back, to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord. And all Israel along with him. And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. So three years were good. His fifth year, he's already dropped the ball. And he's turned away from the Lord and led the people in that regard as well. And so King Shishak, which is, of course, uh, an Egyptian leader. Interestingly enough, for those of you that are interested, this is one of the first times in the scripture, uh, 1 Kings 11 would be the first time it would be done, where they actually name the Pharaoh or the king of Egypt. Now, some people think this might be Shishong the first, uh, that's S-H-E, S-H-O-N-G the first, uh, which we do have some historical relevance to. In fact, the image that you can see up there is an image of that particular Pharaoh and his list of nations that were conquered. And it does seem, if, if it is that guy, that it does refer to Palestinian region and perhaps even the Israelites. 
Kind of interesting if you're into archaeology and history. There's a real person. There's a real history that existed from a biblical perspective. He's also interesting because this is the same guy that Jeroboam ran to when Solomon was chasing him uh, to kill him in 1 Kings chapter 11. So he's kind of interspersed throughout this story. But here's a moment in which he's being used to oppose Rehoboam because Rehoboam has turned against God. This is God in action. And when those things happen, the question is, how will you respond? Will you stay stuck in a moment that is in opposition with God? Or will you reflect on your spiritual position and acknowledge the sovereignty of God? Acknowledge the goodness of God, the justice of God. And this is a thing we see him dealing with in this moment. It's worth looking at because it's a very real human in a very real circumstance. And it's a relatable situation for us because sometimes our choices have put us in opposition to God. And sometimes because of that, we get stuck in that moment. And we're on a path where we're not moving closer to God. We're stuck in worldliness and we're, we're stuck in sin. And we don't see necessarily a way out. And the question is, how? How do we get moving? Even if we realize it's not right, and how could he not know? He's ruling in Jerusalem where the temple of God was. But he cast it aside. He knew. He knew. His grandfather was King David. He knew. His father was King Solomon. He knew. He had been around the wisdom. He had been around the integrity. He knew. All the priests had come to him. He knew. But he chose to reject it and became stuck. So, Shishak rises against him with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and people without number who came with him out of Egypt, the Lubim and the Sukaim and the Ethiopians. And he took the fortified cities of Judah, and he came to Jerusalem. Then Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak and said to them, Thus says the Lord, You have forsaken me, therefore I also have left you in the hand of Shishak. Can you imagine? You got this tension building because this is a mighty and powerful king with a mighty armor. But more frightening than that is when you are confronted with the reality. It's all out there. You've rejected God. And this is judgment. It's not maybe this is judgment. This is judgment. God's hand is moving against your sin. What do you do? The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves. And they said, the Lord is righteous. They humbled themselves and they cast aside a rebellious heart. They humbled themselves. And instead of making excuses, instead of pleading that what they were doing was the right way possible, they acknowledged that God's way is right and true and just and holy. They come unstuck. They get out of the moment. Now, when the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore, I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they will be his servants, that they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms of the nations. They had some learning to do. So Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord. This hurts. And the treasures of the king's house. He took everything. He also carried away the gold shields which Solomon had made. Then King Rehoboam made bronze shields in their place, and he committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard who guarded the doorway of the king's house. <coughs> and whenever the king entered the house of the Lord, the guard would go ahead and bring them out. Then they would take them back into the guard room. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him so as not to destroy him completely. And things also went well in Judah. Skip also over to verse 14. Rehoboam overall was not viewed as a very strong king at all. In fact, in, in terms of his faithfulness to God. In fact, his heart was always generally in a bad place. But he's worth mentioning for this very reason. Verse 14, he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. The acts of Rehoboam first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemai the prophet and of Ido the seer concerning genealogies? And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. But he rested with his father. It's not viewed as a very good king overall. In fact, his cruelty is mostly what he's known for overall. But I like Second Chronicles chapter 12. It's just a moment. 
It's not even a very popular moment that people talk about a lot of times, but it's an, it's an important moment because it shows that he didn't have to stay that way. Even in his wickedness and even in his rejection of God, it would have been just for God to utterly destroy him. And yet God still gave him this opportunity. God still communicated to him through the prophet that judgment was coming. And when they were allowed the time to respond, to react, to acknowledge God, when they humbled themselves, our very good and just God listened and moved and altered his choice there. That Shishak wouldn't utterly destroy them. Oh, that would be a punishment. But God listened. And so we see a couple things happen. That God didn't have to be stuck. He could come unstuck. And we see part of how he did it. That's what we should be listening for. Because if we find ourselves in that moment, how do I get out of this? It's here in the scriptures. And the first thing he did was humble himself. Humble himself. Even though he was the king of such a prominent lineage, he didn't bolster himself up and say, God, do you not know who I am? He humbled himself. Instead of saying, I am the son of the wisest man who ever existed, don't I know what I'm doing? He humbled himself. And he acknowledged God's ways above his own. That is so important for us to know each and every day. You don't have to be stuck. Humble yourself. If you are caught up in sinfulness, humble yourself. Acknowledge God and look for his word. Look for his answer. There you will find the path to become free. You really will. The Lord is righteous. Never forget that. Humble yourself. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him. Don't ever forget that. So as not to destroy him completely, and things also went well in Judah. This tells us about God as well, doesn't it? God's desire is not for us to be sitting uh, in the heavens and looking down, just waiting for a moment to punish us. God is wanting those moments of repentance. God is wanting those moments of humility where we turn to him. We're in a, a broken spirit and a broken heart. We humble ourselves and turn ourselves towards him. This is what God wants. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we know it from that passage that's generally about the, the, the ending of the world and being consumed in fire, but it contains that one thing that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some, some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. So, so patient. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What God wants for you is salvation. What God wants for you is to not remain stuck in sin, but to be free. But the choice is on us to humble ourselves and turn to him because he is the answer, because he has provided a way. And he explains it in these stories, even the ones like Rehoboam, so unexpected. And that's why I love these particular moments. It may not be the big story. But it's good that we dive into them and get a little bit deeper and look for answers of how we move in relatable ways in our lives. We can think about things that would cause us to be stuck. Maybe it's very difficult attitudes that we bear. And on, on the surface, we may look like we are the perfect Christian. We may appear like those chief priests and the elders that we are doing incredibly well, but we may have very dark things in our heart and we may have things that trouble us. And we may look at our brothers and sisters instead of looking for the best things. The first thing that comes out of our mouth is the absolute worst thing. And we complain, complain, complain and tear down, tear down, tear down. We're, we gotta, you're stuck if that's what direction we're moving in. It may be that there's a secret sin that we're dealing with that cuts into us and it holds us back. We're stuck. There's consequences of those things and we know the reality, but are we willing to humble ourselves, turn to God for the answer on how to get out of that? It may be that there's, there's things and fears and doubts that are really diving into you and you've heard something, but instead of turning to God, you turn to the world and you're stuck because you find them beating at you over and over and pushing down your faith over and over and you need freedom and you need relief, but you're getting weary out of it. You don't have to be stuck. There are consequences if you do, and this becomes a warning for sure. But God didn't make you, nor does God desire for you to be in this position that our choices lead us. You ought to be free. 
You ought to thrive in the way that God intended for you to thrive. Which brings us back to our scripture reading. What do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in the vineyard. And he said, I will not. But afterwards he regretted it and went. Okay. He came to the second, said likewise. And he said, I go, sir. But he did not go. This is the point I want us to focus on. You usually get to these things and you say, well, who am I in this story? Am I the first son, the second son? Worthy question. Are you the person who's willing to repent? That's important. But I like this part because it's the meat. It really is the meat that makes it personal. Because sometimes we can think about Christianity and we think it's only in terms of the rules. Did you go or did you not go? And that is a good place to, to build a foundation for understanding of Christianity. Did I do what God said or did I not do what God said? Or did I say I would, but I didn't and reject it. And there's this foundation and structure we build that's really healthy to build on as a foundation. And sometimes we only let it be that. It's just the rules, the do's and the don'ts of Christianity. That's not really strong enough to be a really, really, really excellent Christian. You got to mature and you got to build to something more. And that's where Jesus is getting it. It's personal. This is literally Jesus speaking to people that are having a problem they're stuck in. How personal is that? That our God, our Lord, our King would speak to an individual fairly corrupt, even directly opposed to him. But it's a personal thing. And so he's offering them this personal moment. Same thing for us each and every day. There's a personal aspect of this where it's not just that we're doing things because it's the do's and the don'ts and the rules. But in our spiritual maturity, perhaps our primary motivation grows as well. And our primary motivation should be, am I like Jesus? And am I becoming more and more like Jesus? Rehoboam would have benefited if he had chose to stick with <coughs> repentance and constantly pursue God and ask himself, how can I be more like God? How can I take on more of the characteristics in the nature of God? And how can I give that to my people? And how can I lead them closer to God in the midst of that? That would have been personal. And that would have taken it from just the mechanics of do's and don'ts. And that would have built something stronger than just the rules. And it would have given him strength and freedom a little bit more. But even that in Christianity, there's still more to build on. There is the mechanics of do's and don'ts, important. There is the personal aspect of how can I be like Jesus and how can I be like God? Kind of an intellectual thing, but it is more personal. But then how do I start doing these things, living because I love God so much? That's a whole different level of spiritual maturity. I love God's law. I love the personal relationship with Jesus and knowing that he took great care. But loving God and letting that be the dominant motivation for all that I do, this is a whole different level of freedom. Not freedom from the law and certainly not freedom from personal relationship, but freedom to move as God intended us to live successfully, spiritually, thriving in a way that is in a direct connection with him as he intended. For God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Is there a greater motivation? Because Jesus loved us, he went to the cross and paid a horrendous price for our sins. Because he loved us, he walked amongst mankind. He was resurrected. Because he loves us, Jesus is coming again. If we do what's right and righteous, and if we strive to be like Jesus, but if we grow even more spiritually because we love God, this is excellence in Christianity. And it takes time and it takes effort and it takes choice and it takes faith and it takes us investing in it because it's worth it. Not just because we get something out of it, but because our God is the one true God and because he is right and because he is holy and because he loves you. Return that love, give him that love and let that be the primary <laughs> motivation for everything you do in life. Just stop and imagine how that would change everything you do in life. If what you did was because you love God so deeply and you know him so deeply as he's explained and revealed himself in the word. And because you know what the right path is to please him. 
Imagine your relationships and how it would affect that. Imagine how that would affect uh, your work ethic. Imagine how that would affect that when someone does something against you, 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 you forgive. It's not a struggle to forgive. You're like, okay, because I understand. I, I see how God's forgiven me. I can let go of the hurt and I can grab a hold of what's right and true in God and I can love the world around me the same way he does and I do it for him. This is an utterly uh, different way than the world thinks. But you're not stuck in the world. You're not stuck in those moments. You're holding on to God. And that's the kind of life you should be striving for. More importantly, you are capable of. Rehoboam himself, despite all of his failures, and they are tremendous, he had a taste of that moment. He let it go, but he had a taste of it. And he could have chose to pursue it, but he didn't. You, every single day, have that same opportunity. Pursue it, never let it go, grab a hold of it, and then grab again and keep diving deeper into the Lord. Christianity is so vibrant and full of life, and you have so much space to grow. Not a single one of us ever gets to say, I'm the greatest Christian that ever lived, or there's no more that I can ever learn, or there's, there's no more space for my faith to increase. Now, every single one of us can grow, and I hope that's what we pursue, because we love God. Hard thing sometimes to grab your head around, but pursue it with everything you got. I hope the story of your re- <coughs> poem has been an encouragement to you. Um, I hope, as I try to speak through this, we can get to it, that it changes how you think about your spiritual growth. I hope it encourages you to keep building on your spiritual maturity. There's a lot of space in that. I hope it changes your perspective of how you're going to approach each and every day. The Bible is rich with these huge stories we know of these big characters, but they're just human. And I hope it encourages you to look for those moments smaller stories that are so full of depth that will draw you much, much closer to God. Take advantage of that. Today, as we close out, I hope there's a, a thing that we can, we can serve you in. Uh, there may be a struggle that you're having. There may be a place that you are stuck. I hope you realize today, and maybe you've been sort of mulling it over in your head and your heart going, is that true? Can I really come out of this? The answer is yes. And maybe this is a moment in which you become unstuck, that you you come out of it because you're obedient to God, because you humble yourself and you recognize the Lord is righteous and you recognize he is moving in your life and you recognize you can choose to follow him. If today is that moment, then please let us help you in the midst of that. You don't have to go at it alone. No one's intended to go out alone. God's there for you. His church is here for you. We would love to serve you in whatever way we can. If you do have a need, please let us know as we stand and as we sing.